Good morning, everybody. It's great fun to be here. So raise your hands. How many are from the biological side of the house? Just to get a, OK, so how many, that's a big number. Uh, how many are in the environmental sector? Um, engineers? OK. And I know we have one law person. Do we have any more from the, le yeah, way, <laughs> good, terrific. So I am here today as a proud former fellow. Um, and I was where you were sitting way back in the, you know, when the, when the Flintstones were still roaming the earth. It was and has been a great ride. And, but Cynthia, as she said, asked me to speak about today is the importance of policy scientists uh, and engineers, people that are savvy in policy, but that have a technical background. And uh, as I often do, I, I go back to definitions because that helps me frame what I, what I wanna say. And so I went to, to the source of um, all knowledge to figure out what uh, policy meant. So, I went to the internet, of course, and I found that for the purposes of this talk this morning, I was going to use the definition of policy from the first line of the Wikipedia definition, which is that policy is a deliberate system of principles to guide decisions and achieve rational outcomes. So a deliberate system of principles to guide decisions and to achieve a rational outcome. Well, you know, that's pretty important, pretty heavy stuff. And um, the answer to the question that Cynthia posed, is it important to have scientists and engineers be policy savvy, is of course yes. And uh, you knew that that was gonna be the answer, so of course that's why I'm sitting here. What is a little bit harder, though, is how to illustrate how that definition of policy is implemented in the real world and how that has tailored my path and my career. And I thought that perhaps what I could do today is give you a couple of examples of how the technical and policy interface have played a role in my life. I'd like to say a few words about that, but importantly, I'd like to give you a chance to ask me questions. That's the most fun for me, um, because I find that uh, I get challenged and I get to think um, on my feet, and sometimes I'll give you right answers and I'll, sometimes I'll give you wrong answers. So the deal with the AAAS uh, folks here is if I don't like the way I respond to your answers, they won't post my, uh, my speech on the web. So just, just so you know, be kind and be nice. Um, so, policy, the deliberate system of principles to guide decision and to achieve rational outcomes, right? So, policy can be used as a beacon to show the way, to figure out what the next path is, what the strategy is. It can also set a framework. This is how we're going to accomplish a given goal. But it also arises from the experience that you have and you realize that in doing something, you've established policy and you really weren't thinking about that. So policy comes as a consequence of trying to operationalize a, a, an experience or, or a particular um, enterprise. But of course, policies are also a convenient way of escaping and avoiding responsibility and innovation oh yes, it makes perfect sense, but that's our policy and that's the way we're gonna keep doing things, right? So let's don't be those people. We can and we should use the power of policy to guide us forth. So what I'd like to do today is to give you a couple of the examples that have helped me figure out how to make that intersection between the technical and the policy pieces. So, um, Cynthia mentioned it, but for those of you who were here for the 40th anniversary, anybody here, a two-year fellow that was here for the 40th anniversary? Okay, well, like three of you, so good. <laughs> that doesn't spoil my, my uh, talk. Uh, you know that my first job 
actually mapped directly to my experience on Capitol Hill. While I was on the Hill, I worked on a piece of legislation that was designed to bring the information and the technology that was developed in the federal labs to the commercial sector for the benefit of people. And that, that bill was called and is called the Federal Technology Transfer Act. It was a companion bill to a prior law that was called the Bayh-Dole Act, in which the Congress figured out that this massive investment in basic science had the possibility of having actually important commercial application and commercial potential. Now, these two pieces of legislation combined really changed the landscape of how we generate new enterprise and how we use technology, particularly in the, in the biological and biomedical world. I can assure you, when I first started working on this, that I had never transferred a technology in my life. I had no idea what intellectual property matters were, were about. I most certainly had never had to cut a licensing deal. But here I was with the possibility of tapping this important area of science. And I knew, because I was a scientist, I figured out that molecular and cell biology was opening a completely new world. And that that world could, in fact, have a potential to transform the way and the lives of people. Frankly, the field was so new this was another famous unfunded mandate for those of you. How many work on the executive branch? OK. Unfunded mandates, remember that. You are going to be told by Congress what to do, and you're going to be given no resources to do it. So here we were, trying to figure out how to transfer technology from the bench all the way to, to the commercial sector. There were absolutely no roadmaps. And we did this by doing. <laughs> we didn't, we weren't told, uh, it was early enough. The good news is I was early enough in the game that I was, in fact, with a machete going down the jungle and, and cleaning it up for others to follow. So when we made mistakes, which we did, um, we also were able to fix them and correct them and learn from them. And we were able to take risks. Now, in my life, and I hope in yours, one of the most fun things to do is to be out there with the machete, being the first in line, trying to figure out how to put a path forward for things that had never and would never have been experienced before. It was a heady and exciting time. This, this took me from the University of Maryland at Baltimore, which, which gave me the first break. They said, you want to do tech transfer? Fine. What do you know about patents? I said, nothing. And they said, OK, well, go ahead. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Literally, truly. Um, and, and they said, you have to keep it doing everything else you're doing and do tech transfer. Well, I was naive. Who knew? And I said, sure, that sounds like a good plan. My experience there allowed me to get the job at the, at the NIH as the director of the Office of Technology Transfer. Harold Varmus um, gave me that opportunity, and it was and is the largest technology transfer operation, operation of its kind in the world. And from there, that experience led me to be one of 10 commissioners selected by the World Health Organization to look at the interface between intellectual property and health. Now, I will tell you an anecdote. I was two, two days in the job at NIH when I get this call. And the caller says, hi, are you Maria? And I said, yes, I'm Maria. Oh, good, I'm in a cab. I'm so sorry. This is not going to take very long. But I'm Francis Collins. And I was talking to Harold. And he told me that I should talk to you about the Human Genome Project, <laughs> which was fun. The Genome Project, by the way, we had the 10th anniversary last year. This was 1995. This call was a year after Francis had started and the world, well, it was started actually in 1990, but where, where it really started to get a hold of. So the question was, you know, 
what does the sequencing of the human genome mean? What does it really mean for intellectual property? What about, what about these genes? Can they be patented? Should they be patented? Who owns them? And uh, of course, this is a question that is still being asked today, but it was for sure being asked at that time. So here we were, the Office of Technology Transfer. We were deal makers. We knew how to do deals. We knew how to license technology. We knew how to interact with companies. We knew how to do the CRADAs. We knew how to do the, the, the agreements. But how were we going to move forward in this completely new world of genes and the result of this human genome enterprise? But you see, as director of the office, I was responsible. I had the delegated authority for policy for all of DHHS, which meant CDC, FDA, NIH, and all of the grantees of NIH, which of course spanned the, the, not only the country, but the world. Now, for those of, no, of you who know a little bit of this history, you may know that we were at odds, our position was at odds with the position of another uh, nice and warm federal agency, the Department of Commerce, and importantly, the Patent and Trademark Office. Patent and Trademark Office had very clearly determined that you, know, you could, in fact, patent genes. And it was a huge uproar because companies, some of them sided with the PTO, but some of them actually didn't. They were concerned that it was a rush to patent a gene, and therefore you couldn't use it for other purposes or for other indications. And the simple discovery of the gene didn't mean that you had a utility associated with that, with that particular gene. In fact, it was so controversial that I sat next to my colleague, um, the head of, the commissioner of the Patent and Trademark Office, in front of Arlen Specter, who had just come from the Anita Hill hearings. So that was a fun time. And um, I was sitting there being grilled by people in Congress. We were both grilled, to, to tell you the truth, because people were trying to understand this issue. It was, in fact, a really crazy time. And it was a wonderful ride. There were many, many, many sleepless nights, many conversations with Francis, many conversations with Craig Venter, many conversations when the genome was finally to be published with science and nature and the conditions upon which we were going to be able to, um, to publish the human genome. But I had, and I was very lucky to have, some of the smartest people in the world in my office. My deputy was a lawyer, who is now the head lawyer at, um, at NIH, Barbara McGarity, who's absolutely fantastic. I had Jack Spiegel, who was a, a scientist but a whiz in policy. I had Steve Ferguson, who was one of the best licensing people in the world. And the firepower of those three individuals and the rest of my staff really helped us figure out what these policies and what these guiding lights for this new world of the human, human genome ought to be. It was, at the time, by the way, heresy. And I'm happy to tell you that today, those policies have stood the test of time. And they have been adopted by many, many parts of the world. Looking back, though, it was clear that the Bayh-Dole Act and the FTTA provided a vacuum, a policy vacuum. And those of us lucky to have been there at that time were able to help fill that vacuum and sort out what these strategies for the future could be. So policy as a beacon and as a light for showing the way and showing the path. Once, once they were established, we knew what we could do. We knew what our degrees of freedom were. We knew how to make our licensing deals, and, and we knew how to negotiate agreements because we were confident, and we are confident today, that there is a well-thought strategy behind it. So policy sheds light, helps us with strategy. But also policy, as I mentioned earlier, results from experience. So the need to figure out and how to oper operationalize something. And I, I'm going to give you an example of that from another part of my life and another part of my career. 
In 2001, I was handed an opportunity of a lifetime. Um, I was asked to head a tiny organization to develop new medicines against tuberculosis. I mean, I, I mean tiny, including me, we had three people in staff. That's how small we were. And they had given us the mandate. It was created by the Rockefeller Foundation, and we were given the mandate to develop new TB drugs. Now, by that time, I, had, I knew how to do the deals. I knew how to transfer technology. I knew how to go to pharma or biotech or academic institutions and look for technologies and move them forward. But you see, we were naive. We thought that there were gonna be all sorts of antibiotics just sitting, waiting for us to just come in, pluck them, and move them forward. Well, that certainly uh, wasn't gonna happen. But we knew that the world was changing and that it was a special opportunity. In 2001, here's how the world looked. The human genome had just given us the technology and the wherewithal to figure out what the genome sequences were for many of these uh, infectious agents. So we, all of a sudden, had the genome of the TB bacillus. So with that, we knew where we could attack the, the bacillus. We also were in a particular um, time in which there was money, <laughs> unlike the last few years. Governments actually had money, and we had the newly created Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that was looking to figure out how to change the world, how to improve technology, how to move things, how to move things forward. And the third is that communications were there to the point where, unlike before, we could go around the world and look for what was happening. We could see people and children dying of infectious diseases. We could get in our living rooms these horrible images of death and destruction. So technology, funding, need, that prompted a movement in Cape Town in the year 2000 to bring together the private sector, the public sector, and not accept the status quo and say, we're going, as a community and as a world, develop new medicines against tuberculosis. Well, these are diseases of the poor. And when you have diseases of the poor, there are very few people who want to come in the game. So it was important for us to form a partnership from the different groups. I mean, think about it. How can a pharmaceutical company or a biotechnology company who's who has to respond to the need of the stockholder to produce a particular revenue invest in a technology that was going to, for all intents and purposes, give them absolutely no return for their investment. So we formed what is now a very trite expression, which is a public-private partnership. And you will forgive me for my editorial comments on public-private partnerships, because I think that if you get somebody from the government of shaking hands with somebody from the private sector, we all call it a public-private partnership. It wasn't that at the time. It was truly a different way of doing business. And in particular, the TB Alliance was a product development partnership. So we had a very, very clear goal. We were going to develop new medicines for tuberculosis. Now, we realized, to our horror, that we were doing a fairly good job at getting technologies, the few that were there, or bringing in very early stage technology to develop drugs. But we had thought, and uh, this will date some of you, that if we built it, they would come. Remember the movie, famous line? If you build it, they will come. Turns out that's not the case. If you build it, they may not necessarily come. We had, in fact, forgotten the power of policy. 
we had forgotten in developing the technical aspects of this, the importance of advocacy, the importance of convincing the people why it was that what we were doing made sense for them. So in fact, the WHO was officially saying, the money you're giving to the TV Alliance is taking away money for actually delivering TB drugs to people who need them today. Talk about a tricky situation. Governments were not really keen on the prospect. I mean, we said, we're gonna develop a TB drug and TB regimens that are gonna bring eight months regimen to two months. And the ministers of health were saying, oh my God, we've we have a trained workforce that is used to giving TB drugs for eight months. If you now have to give TB drugs for two months, then we're gonna have to fire people. We can't do that. <laughs> really? Okay. So, and the World Bank sat and said, well, you know, how much is this gonna cost? We support a lot of this information. So it became very clear that we had not articulated our goals, which were to make those treatment affordable to patients, to make them available in even the remotest locations, but to also make them adopted by the countries that actually had tuberculosis in their midst. So we had to recalibrate and we had to embark on an aggressive advocacy campaign on what is now our AAA strategy to make things affordable, available, and adopted. By that time, I had hired my scientific staff. They could keep on going with the, with the technical aspects of the enterprise, but I had to now look forth and figure out how through policy interventions we could actually make this a really um, formidable force. Things have, in fact, changed, and much to our delight, and perhaps to the chagrin of Mel Spiegelman, who now heads the alliance, the WHO is saying, unless we have new drugs, how can we possibly tackle this epidemic? We have multidrug-resistant tuberculosis, we have extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis, where are those new drugs? TV Alliance, get a move on, you need to get, you need to get things done. Ministers of Finance were saying, are you kidding me? Eight months to two months? Great, that's great savings. Come on, Ministers of Health. Make sure that you're able to be there and implement because you're going to be able to, to um, get to many more people. And in fact, agencies like the uh, regulatory agencies like the US Food and Drug Administration and the European uh, regulators banded together to help us because they realized that we were not developing one drug. You know, you don't give antibiotics by themselves in situations like this. You have to give combinations. So now we have path forward. Instead of having to approve one drug that takes about 10 to 15 years, then approve the next drug 10 to 15 years and have a 24 year window, we couldn't wait that long. So the regulators helped us to put it together and to be able to figure out how we could do combinations. After all, as humans, we take them as combinations. So they provided guidances for cancer and tuberculosis. Nobody knew how we had um, gotten tuberculosis there, but we did because we knew how to get to the policy piece. So today, um, I've learned that in a healthy organization, you need to have three legs to that stool. So the first leg, I mean, you can have a stool with four legs, I suppose, but you really don't need the fourth leg. Two legs won't work, one leg definitely not, um, unless you have an anchor of some sort. But three legs work. So the first leg is science, is program, is the actual technology that you are going to move or deliver in, in our space. And, and I think it works the same for IT, it works for, for, for other um, enterprises as well. But science rules. If you have bad science, if you have bad infrastructure, then it will collapse. But science without the policy piece also doesn't provide the right balance. You need the policy to be the beacon to set the way, you need the policy to establish you as a thought leader in that field. If you wanna be the leader, you gotta be like 
drugs. You had to be the first in class and you got to be the best in class. And the third part, of course, is the administrative core. If you don't have good people and if you don't have the funding, I don't care how good your technology is, I don't care how good your policy is, but you need the ability to implement. So in my career, I develop and I try to make sure that those three pieces are in place and that they are sound and that they are um, the best that, that we can have to move forward. Today, I, I am honored to be heading the foundation for the NIH. Um, this foundation was created by Congress. There are other sister foundations. In fact, the foundation for the CDC precedes us. The foundation for the FDA, the reagan Udall Foundation just uh, um, came online. And as of last year, the foundation for the um, Department of Agriculture uh, was, was put in place. It was very interesting because I got called to the Hill about three or four times to talk about how this new agriculture foundation, what were the lessons learned from the NIH foundation, which is considered very successful. And I can say that with absolutely no shame because it's the work of my predecessors. Two or three years from now, I'll tell you how well I've done. But um, one of the things that we said is our foundation has no money. So in fact, work like a company. We have to go look for the projects and we have to look for funders to fund our projects. The Foundation for NIH allows us to take good ideas, whether it's scientific ideas or policy ideas, and make them real. We are, what um, one of my board members, uh, Frida Lewis Hall from Pfizer said, um, you know, we have to take things from ideas to I do's. And I think that's what we do. We I do it. We actually can go ahead and implement and move things forward. And it's very exciting. One of the things I did tell, and those of you in the ag world, I'll, I'll tell you that if you're interested, this is a wide open field and it's a fun place to be. And in fact, I've hired some of your fellows. So I, need, yeah, I need you to know. Um, they, I said, we have no money, give them some money. And they did. They gave him $200 million, thank you very much, which makes me absolutely uh, jealous, but it's a great start because it allows you to catalyze truly interesting programmatic activities. They have to match them, um, which is tricky. I'm also the chair of the science board for the Food and Drug Administration, and I was consulted. How many of you know the 21st Century Cures legislation? So I was one of the people that was called to the Hill, both on the Senate side and on the House side, to talk about biomarkers and to talk about 21st century cures in general. And most recently, I've been tapped as one of 18 individuals from around the world for this um, commission on the global health risk framework. And the World Bank, the WHO, um, and others have asked the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine actually, to figure out what are the lessons learned from the Ebola um, epidemic and what are the lessons learned from other pandemics and from the flu, et cetera, so that we can come up with um, a plan forward to a framework so that this doesn't happen again, so that our response to the next pandemic isn't the same deer in the headlight look that we had um, as the case with Ebola. So without any doubt, um, none of these opportunities in my life um, for thought leadership, really, which is the other aspect of policy, would have been before me if I didn't have the technical underpinnings. Now, I'm a card-carrying biophysicist, but I have to tell you, I haven't been in a lab for a long time, which is probably a very good thing. But um, the policy know-how, what I learned when I was in your place all those years ago has actually had an enormous and important impact in my life. So I wish you great success wherever you might land. Have fun, work hard, be genuine, and be generous. But most of all, I can't wait to see how you're going to change the world. So thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you have an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, we have some microphones here. Just raise your hand. And anybody want to come over? Yeah. 
Hello. Uh, Laura Ahern, USAID. I was wondering if you had worked with any social scientists, such as medical anthropologists, social uh, sociologists of science, human geographers, um, political economists, throughout any of your different assignments. Um, we have indeed. Uh, both at the TB Alliance, I do so now at the foundation for some of our global um, programs. But also interestingly, um, I am working right now, Jeff Sachs asked me to be part of the Sustainable Development Network group. And um, I'm part of the health group. And of course, that is intimately and actively uh, part of that discussion. So we're setting, you know, about the Millennium Development Goals, right? So we're setting the next goals and we'll be having this big meeting. Without that information, without the, the, the real life information from the field, uh, much of what we do, again, you will build it and they won't come. Uh, let, me, let me give you a, an example that is not exactly on point, but, but it's illustrative of the kinds of things that, that we do. One of our grants is on um, uh, limiting the population of mosquitoes around the world that could, um, that have, that, that, that uh, are the cause of malaria in these endemic countries. One of the ways we're doing that is by gendering the mosquitoes infertile and therefore reducing the population of mosquitoes in a particular area. But as you can imagine, that is a very complicated um, and important discussion to be had with the local populations and with the people in the field. You can't possibly just go to Baltimore, Maryland and say, we're gonna release these mosquitoes, isn't it great? You're gonna reduce the number of bites you have. So we've worked very long and very hard with people in the field, with anthropologists, with sociologists, with the governments, with the local authorities, with the community people, because we do appreciate and understand that what we're doing is gonna make their lives better, but it is a choice they have to make. And so, without a doubt, that is extremely important to do. And USAID does a great job, yeah. Yes. Thank you, Alex Moseson with USAID. Uh, thank you very much for being with us here today and a very impressive talk and, and career, of course, that led to it. Many of us in the executive branches are on the end of executing rather than creating policy and will go on to careers that have us similarly placed. So I wonder if you can speak to the ability of folks in positions like that to influence policy from the bottom up, so to speak, without being in a position that has policy in the title. Well, so remember, you'll grow up, right? And, <laughs> and, what, um, and what you will bring is the field experience. What you will bring is the experience in the ground. Uh, I don't think that you can underestimate your ability to affect policy. Sometimes you think policy is done at a very, very high level. True enough, but policy is also done at the local level. You know, one of my favorite examples is, uh, I always, I love pilot projects. People hate pilot projects, but I love pro pilot projects because it's a proof of concept. So one of the ways to affect policy is to say, well, here's my universe, here's my world, this is what I do. And I think that if we could do X, Y, or Z, this would have a better result. Let's do a pilot project. Let's figure out if this works. And if in fact it works, then you have a recipe or a, posi or a possible future outcome. So find ways, and I don't know specifically where you are and what you're doing, but find ways in which the technical aspects or the or day-to-day the, uh, -day aspects could be brought as an example for others to follow. How can you maximize that experience? How can you do things better? So um, that would be what, what I would suggest. When, for example, in this commission, by the way, where we have these people from around the world, I co-chair one of the workshops, and one of the workshop, um, this workshop is about, now think about it, talk about, I've been losing sleep over this one. 
how to develop new interventions, vaccines, diagnostics, medicines, even protective gear for the next um, threat to, in, in the world. How do we develop that? How, how do we know what the next one coming in is going to be? How do we know what we will need to test? How do we test it? I mean, we can't give people anthrax to go testing them for whether something works. So in that, the experience in the field, the experience of the people that actually have had to deal with the uh, Ebola situation or with the HIV situation or with SARS is incredibly important to us because it informs what we can recommend for, for future. So don't underestimate the, the power and the importance of, of the people that are working um, at, the, at the practical level. Yes. Oh, yeah, sorry. I have one here and one there, too. Saw you. Is it working? Yeah. OK, Irina Pala, I'm at the State Department now. Um, I was on the Hill the other day, and they had a briefing from the Illinois Science and Technology Cooperation, something organized by a former AAAS fellow, by the way, Jeff Margolis. So um, the briefing was about sort of the strengths of the state of Illinois. They were focusing on new materials to be you know, very strong in that in the future. And they had a scientist from Argonne there, and in his talk he mentioned the fact that scientists at national labs actually are not really looking towards tech transfer or anything because that is not encouraged at all at the national labs. I wasn't really aware of that, and I'm wondering how do you see that in terms of like policy or driving them to, to think in this sort of more applied, get a business started way. To Okay, so I'm gonna give you the politically incorrect answer, but that's my trademark, so why not? When I started in the tech transfer world, scientists were, you know, the closest, t transferring technology was the closest thing to prostitution. You were supposed to do, you know, very, very directed science and, uh, because it was something that you loved and you wanted to do and you wanted to move the frontier. And here I was saying, isn't there something that you can commercialize? Um, if you do this right, you will have a bell-shaped curve. The bell-shaped curve that will, will the, 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 the apex of the curve will vary. I mean, sometimes it will be skewed to one end and sometimes it will be skewed to the other end. And uh, here's what I mean. Bell, you have scientists that are going to be so entrepreneurial that they think they know better than you, that they form more companies than you, that you are just a slow poke and are, are standing in their way. There are scientists that say, hell no, we won't go. This is, this is pure science and this is where I want to be. But the majority of the scientists, in my experience, want their technology used. If you can find a practical application, it may not be them. They may not want to do it themselves, but they're happy to disclose it and give it to you so you can move it forward. And that's the majority. Now, if you're at MIT, you're, you're closer to the entrepreneurial, you know, the bell shape is closer to the entrepreneurial. If you may be at Argonne, I don't know the situation in Argonne, maybe you're closer to, to the other end. But it's always a bell-shaped bell curve. I will say the following. There's nothing that will entice people more than competition, especially scientists. And if they see that their colleague has gotten recognition or that their technology has made it to market, they say, hey, you know, I can do that. I mean, Joe Blow just does this. I'm much brighter and much better. And it works. And it absolutely works. And when they figure out their comfort level, when they figure out where they want to be, it's amazing how you are able to actually talk to them. And they're very keen. They just don't want to do it themselves. It's not that it may or may not be encouraged, but it's what they get practically out of it. So if you're able to lower that energy barrier, if you're able to talk to them, have them disclose the technology, and then you figure out what is the, the application. It's, it's amazing. And then you start forming a culture where people will disclose to you what they have. So it's not an insurmountable um, 
obje uh, objection. And it does come from the top, by the way. It has to be encouraged by the leadership. There's no question about it. Now, the pendulum did swing a little bit to the far um, entrepreneurial side in which everything was supposed to be tech transfer and you were supposed to get millions and billions of dollars. Now, when I was doing this actively, for every $2 million of funding, you would get one invention disclosure. For every invention, you needed about 20 invention disclosures to have something that was actually patentable. And even if it is patentable, in order for you to have commercial application, you needed a lot more of those. So you can imagine the attrition. And it's a very hard thing to do to tell somebody your child is ugly, your technology won't work. But that's what you have to do. So, so it's a fine balance, but it can be done. You know, I think I had a question here and a question over there. Yeah. Hi, um, Ashok Ram Subramanian, U.S. Department of State. Uh, thank you for your uh, talk. So I'm just completing my year of fellowship and. Uh, Looking back, my biggest difficulty has been work-life balance. Um, I have two small children, and it almost seems to me that in this town you have to choose. Yeah, you have to, you can choose to sometimes ignore your family responsibilities and work really hard, or if you spend a lot of time with your family, then you're not working as hard as your colleagues. Uh, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Thank you. I do, actually. I, I um, do quite a bit of career counseling, and I get to talk to a number of, of groups and a number of people. And the good news is you're not alone. The bad news is you're not alone. It is. It is a very important issue, and, and um, I thought I was very clever describing it this way. And it turns out people in the, uh, you know, in this uh, sociology know this very well. And, and and it has to do with the three circles of of balance in your life. Again, with the three stool uh, analogy. The first one is your work, and how important your your work is, and the expectations of your work. Second one, you know, so, so that's the, the broad circle, the, the bigger circle. Then you have your family, which is not only critically important, but it's your legacy, the closest thing you will ever have to a legacy, and you better get that right. But the other part of the circle is who you are as an individual, the part of you that nobody else sees, the part of you that you see only at night with yourself, and you determine whether you're doing well or you're not doing well or you're happy or you're not doing happy. When those circles are healthy, you're having a great time because you have the right balance. If one of those circles is out of whack, the other two will support you. You may be having a bad time personally, but your family's great and your job is fabulous, and that still is good. But if you have two of those, that are not working, then you're in trouble. So the key, I think, is to figure out how to get the right balance. It isn't about this town. You'll find the same everywhere. I work 24 seven. I was just in Peru, which is where I'm from, with my father, taking him to, to um, a hospital appointment with my you know, cell phone talking to my office. But technology does help and the ability to be connected does help. And you need to have that conversation with your peers and with your, with your bosses. If you produce and there is no shortcut for hard work and good work, no shortcuts. If you produce and you're able to do it in less hours and you're able to be a productive member of the team, I don't know of any boss that will expect you to be sitting in that chair for X hours. You also have, of course, the flexibility of being able to continue that work outside. So finding that balance for you is, is important. But understanding that it doesn't and it will not supplant hard work is also something that you have to appreciate. If you are a productive member of that team, 
you will not be begrudged time for your family or time for yourself. That's been my experience. Anyway, as a boss, um, I promised myself that when I got to be the boss, I was going to be very sensitive. I was, uh, again, in the Flintstone era, you were supposed to have a baby, drop it and say, oh, look at that, a baby, and move on and, <laughs> and, and go back to work, right? I mean, maternity leave, seriously? I mean, who thought about that concept? Um, and so, and so um, I promised myself that I would never do that, that I would understand the needs of the parent, both, you know, the mother, the fathers, and balance that out. Having said that, I'm not running a country club. I need people to perform, and I, people, I need people to work. But if I know I have a good employee that will give their all and that are a good part of the team, then I am very happy to be able to be a little bit more flexible with their time and their place. Fairness in the workplace and as a boss is extremely important. So you can't give priority to one group and not to another. There are people that choose not to have children. So why would I give particular um, benefits to those who choose to have children, but the person that chose not to have a child has a mother with Alzheimer's? So you have to understand and the dynamic of the worst force, and when you get to be the boss, those are the kinds of things that you need to be very sensitive to the balance, the parity, the fairness. But uh, if you have good employees, they will, they will respect you for that and they would appreciate that. Uh, I have that patient man over there, I think. And then you, yeah. So Olga, uh, now it's got you. Hi, hey. Okay, uh, Andrew Miklos, National Institutes of Health. Um, thanks for all your insights and your experiences. Uh, I was wondering, you had focused uh, on policy as a beacon, and you had slightly touched on sort of the potential problems with policy as a barrier to completing uh, one's mission. Do you have any experience or any advice with regards to being able to overcome them or ways that you can reset policies when they cause problems as opposed to solving them? Oh, God, yes. So <laughs> where are you at NIH? National Institute of General Medical Sciences. Oh, GMS, okay. So, um, this is particularly true in government and in big organizations, big multinational companies, where policies have developed over time, sometimes as defensive mechanisms against abuse or to address a particular situation that happened at a particular point in time. There are many reasons where, why policies are obsolete. It could be uh, the policies are, are a barrier. They could be obsolete. I mean, you no longer need certain policies because you have computers, for heaven's sakes. You don't need to have everybody, you know, doing something manually and prescribed it to be manual. There are times where policy is defensive just to make sure that people don't go off the rails. So in my experience, if you are queen, you can say, let's look at this policy, let's figure out what the impact is, what happens if this policy is changed and if it's not in place. And you'd be surprised how many times nothing happens and in fact, everything still runs and it's just the same. It is harder to try and change policy that has been used for many, many years and that people have been using for many years. But it isn't because it's hard to change the policy necessarily. It's because it's hard to change the mentality of the people who are used to working under that policy. So there you go with the advocacy campaign, right? So you have to, in order for people to change, they have to see a benefit to them. What is it for me? What have you done for me lately? And it's human nature and it will happen all over your career. So changing policy for changing policy's sake is probably not worth the effort. Changing policy because it furthers a goal and it gets you closer to where you need to go, it's important. And in that case, you work at the NIH data. Data is critical. If you can 
if you can produce the 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 technical legal um, you know administrative background that allows you to justify that change change will happen people are rational beings and you will have to establish a, an advocacy campaign an education campaign but as long as you have two or three champions that are able to prove how this will be better you will be able to change it it's not simple but you will be able to change it uh, changing people's uh, thought process, I think, is, is the hardest thing. But use data. Data helps. Yes. Thank you. Rima Bjorklund, first year fellow at EPA. And I wondered if we will, if there any way for uh, policy to get ahead of technology. It seems that we tend to, the technology is there, and then we start scrambling to get the implications right. Is there any group that actually is um, kind of scientifically crystal, crystal ball gazing so that we don't always trail it. I'm thinking, for example, of a three-parent baby. Um, and now we're scrambling to figure out how we're going to, the implication, the policy implications of that. That's just one small example. You know, if we could get ahead of, pol of, uh, of many things and develop policies, we would be much better off or much worse off. I don't know which one it's going to be because you develop things in a vacuum. Um, I, um, from the social perspective, we are grappling with a lot of the practical implications of same-sex marriage you know, from, from, a, from an organizational standpoint for, for uh, multi-parent um, children, et cetera. Um, I don't know the answer to that, to tell you the truth. With respect to policies for uh, technical advances, new ways of, you know, splicing genes, or new ways of generating energy, or new ways of, of uh, regulating a, a particular medicine, I think there are ways of getting ahead the, of the curve. Uh, you can certainly think through the implications, think through what um, the potential outcomes are going to be. It's a, it's a labor-intensive exercise because you have to figure out all the possible ramifications. And I can bet you, donuts to dollars, that they, there will be one that you hadn't figured out and that that's where it came. But the more you are prepared, the more you have thought through some of the potential implications, the better off you will be to handle that straggler. Because you say, OK, it didn't work this way, it didn't work that way, but maybe we can figure out the policy here. There are people, and I think they're an extremely important part of the social network, that are actually thinking about this. Um, many years ago, the, st uh, the, the State Department brought together a group of people to what was called Horizon, and I forget the name of the year. And they put us in different groups, and they put us in different rooms. It was um, mostly people from the federal government, but there were a few stragglers, and I was one of them. And they had different scenarios for what the world would look like. So what happens if the world is in total lockdown? What happens if there's a massive crash of this huge dam in China and we have massive migration of populations? What happens if you know, we have genetic engineering go amok? What happens if the world is one big happy place? And it was a very important exercise for me because I had actually never thought through that we all then had to come together. I mean, the lockdown people was really scary. I wasn't one of them, but they actually shut down the room and wouldn't let anybody in or out because they were in lockdown. I go, whoa, okay. <laughs> so it was really something. Um, so when we all came together, it was amazing the different reaction to the same issue, and it was amazing the number of of um, commonalities even in these different and, and, and strange scenarios. And policy was one of them, getting ahead of the policy, getting ahead of the game, being able to sort out the future was one of them. Um, so I don't know how we do that, but I do know that looking for different scenarios and different possibilities and looking at the technology and their implication is, is certainly one of them. Thank you. Anyone else? I have one back. 
Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is uh, Paul Mungai. I'm at the U.S. Department of State. I'm in the Office of UNESCO Affairs. And uh, one of the things that's been really interesting during the course of my fellowship is how the U.S. engages to work on different policy priorities with multilateral organizations. And you spoke a little bit about um, when you were working on TB, the World Health Organization and the World Bank. And I think that, you know, what's become very clear to me is that there are incredible possibilities there, but also lots of barriers. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about your experience interacting with those agencies. Um, thank you, yes, happy to. Um, the United States has been, and perhaps less so these days, quite insular. Uh, we've we've um, been thinking about ourselves and our issues and our problems, and we're always surprised that the rest of the world doesn't get our issues. <laughs> We always wonder why it is that they don't understand our point of view. And, and um, I think we've tried to do a better job in, in the past few years, certainly since 9-11, to try and understand what the, what the different dynamic is out there. These organizations, the, the World Bank, uh, particularly the UN agencies like the WHO, are responsible to 160 some nations around the world, of which the United States is one. And having the understanding of what the different um, priorities and the different needs of these nations are help us understand a little bit how we can put a path forward. So things that for me were obvious were certainly not obvious to people uh, around the world. Um, things that I took for granted were certainly not the same. And I was quite educated, and sometimes quite um, rudely so, in the realities of other countries and in the, in the uh, ethos of other countries. So what I found to be very helpful to answer your question was to listen to sit down and really listen to what people were saying. Not what I wanted to hear, but what they were saying. So, for example, I would say, oh, you know, they're, they're blocking us. If I really thought about it after I went home, they weren't really blocking us. They were stating their position. And so, the trick for me when I had to deal with these situations, sitting at WHO, sitting with, with um, these different commissions, is where are they coming from? What is their issue? And once you figure out what their issue is, you can decide, sorry, I can't go there, can't, can't budge. Or, oh, that's what you were worried about. And it may be something completely unrelated to what you thought they were worried about. So try and get a true and genuine understanding of what it is they're telling you, either because they're rolling their eyes or they're shrugging or they're, they're you know, the English could be a barrier. We also assume that they all have to speak English, by the way, um, and they do. So, so my recommendation is um, be very sensitive to what it is they're actually, listen, be really sensitive to what they're really asking. You need them. You need them. There is no way, for example, in the medical field that you can go around the world and do an Ebola vaccine without the imprimatur of the UN agencies. You can't do it because the UN agencies are the gateway, are the key to unlock those countries, are the key to the ministries of health. They trust the UN agencies more than they trust the US government. So in order for you to be able to implement your program, you have to find ways to do that. Yes, so bilateral, multilateral um, uh, agencies and groups are extremely important. I'm not gonna say it's easy, but I will tell you that you need to listen and you need to find the places of common interest that will allow you to, to get to your goal. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Kara Podkaminer. I'm at the Department of Energy. Um, so I really I'm sorry, like Department? Department of Energy. I really liked your list at the end of working hard and being generous. And sometimes I like to just think that all I need to do is go to work and work hard and be generous and do all those good things. But it, it turns out that I'm only existing in this small little world. Um, and so, you know, it's hard to know where that's going to take me because I don't necessarily interact with a lot of people. And I, of course, have heard the message well, but perhaps not practiced it as well as I should of networking. Um, and so from the perspective of someone who, as you mentioned, um, is looking for good people, how do you go about finding those people who are so crucial to your organization? Oh, God, I pray a lot. <laughs> um, how do I go about looking for good people? Well, if you're lucky, good people will come to you. But you have to, social media now, of course, is, is a key thing. So I, I have to tell you, can I tell a story? I, I, I love telling stories, as you probably have gathered. Um, I was looking for um, my chief of operations, and, which is really a, a chief of staff. And my, my board said, you have to call a chief of operations because they're going to have line responsibilities. OK, fine. So I put out um, the, uh, I, I just put it in LinkedIn and, and a couple of other places. And I got 89 resumes within two days. And a third of them were military, because they knew how to put those boots on the ground. And I'm thinking, no, no, no. So you have to, you have to be careful of how you advertise. And you need to be looking and networking. The, the best way to get people is through people. You can do it through LinkedIn. And I certainly do and, and, and uh, interview a number of people cold because I think the resume is awesome. And in fact, I've hired uh, quite a few people just because they sent us their resume. But if you can link with others, so the, the famous rule, right? You talk to one person and you ask them for two names. That person, then you go to those persons and you, go, you ask them for two names. Then you go to those. And so you start opening that network just very simply, can you give me two other people that you think I should talk about? And at some point, that person is going to say, you know, I, ha I saw that you, I heard you were looking for a communications director. Uh, I, I just met this young woman, and I like her very much. So don't underestimate that, the ability. So go through the social networks. It, it actually does work. You will go through a screen. Make sure you match the. This is the other thing. Make sure you read the position description, please, and the web page of, <laughs> of the organization. It's amazing how many people come and have no idea, never read the web page, no idea what we do, and send the resume. And I think I'd be great for this position. I'm going, seriously? I mean, you don't even know what a gene is. How can you possibly think that you can uh, interact with, uh, with uh, you know, my biomarkers group? So. Read the position description, please. Read the web page, and then find for a match. The same thing goes, by the way, for um, prizes. I was the, the head of the Lasker Foundation, the president of the Lasker Foundation. For you, it, the, those of you in the biomedical sciences, you know that that is the highest award you can get in the United States. And it's a short list for the Nobel. I hate to say it, but it's true. Lasker has a very, very tough jury. and. Um, when I was doing that, I learned several things. So the first thing I learned is you will never get an award you're not nominated for. Think about that. So don't say, well, how come all these? Well, they get nominated. They have, a, they have a, a network that actually will nominate them. Make sure, this is what reminded me of this point, make sure that when you're nominated for that award that it makes sense to you that it matches what you've done and your qualifications. And there are awards for young people, and there are awards for people that are more senior in their careers. And the third thing is, you won't get an award the first year. It's very rare. So stick with it. And women are particularly bad about this. By the way, we go, oh, they didn't select me. You know, I'll, I won't apply again. You're slighted. No, 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 no. They have a list of people that are very worthy that I can't get it. So stick with it. There are times where these awards will have, you think the Nobel Prize just gets 
the, the, the first person and they say, oh, that's it? No, 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 no. They already have a group of very, very good people. It's very unusual to get these prizes at the first try, so stick with it, which is the other thing. Yeah. All right, finally. Um, Janet Tree, I'm a second year fellow at the National Science Foundation, mm -hmm. and you've talked about being queen of your business, but if you were queen of policy... I mean, I'm self-appointed, by the way. Nobody, <laughs> and nobody else believes legitimate. that. <laughs> so if we appoint you queen of policy, where do you see that there is the biggest need for scientists to influence policy at this point? Honest answer? Everywhere. <laughs> Truly. Everywhere. Um, the nerds rule, right? This is, this is now a, a, a time and a place where we have information technology that is just booming. We have all of this science. I mean, we are in biomedical sciences where electronics was in the 1950s, right? We are just starting. Think about what's happening with, with environment. Think about what's happening with law, for heaven's sakes. I mean, you don't think that this is a society that's based in technical expertise, whether it's the social sciences or whether it's information technology or whether it's, you know, gene splicing. It, it absolutely is permeating every aspect of who we are and what we do. And it all has implications. So find a niche, find a place, find an organization, find a company that understands that this balance is changing and that the power of science and technology is going to be a driver. And once you have that, and you have the technical background, and you have the policy experience, then you will be able to be on the leadership and, and be part of the thought that goes into where that company needs to be. I mean, newspapers. Newspapers. Newspapers have decided. I mean, those who remembers where in the newspapers had eight columns? Have you noticed they're smaller? They're six now. And have you noticed that the New York Times is saying we're, we're going to be going to New York Times, going digital? I mean, this is changing. You don't think there's policy there? You don't think that there's expertise there? Of course there is. So um, I think the world is wide, wide open. And just like the tech transfer part, which was a small part of, of, of the landscape of this country and, in fact, of the world, I think it's wide open, wide open. What we're doing with gene drives, what we're doing with fracking, what we're doing with, um, you know, the ability to communicate across borders and across geographies. I think it's incredibly exciting. I think the best is yet to come. So go at it. Thank you. So, have fun, work hard, be genuine, be generous, be engaged. So thank you very much, Maria. Um, I think that was, uh, as I said, couldn't have uh, imagined a better person to share that kind of knowledge and insights from so many fascinating experiences and varied experiences over, over a long career, and clearly more to go. Um, I want to follow up on a, just a couple of things. Again, um, you know the staff harp on, on networking all the time. Um, I know that, um, how, how many of you uh, are going to be renewing for the, for the next year? Just so we have a little show of hands here. Great. Obviously a lot. We love that every year. Of course, your offices are very happy you're staying on. And we're happy to have you too. But we're also excited about the fellows who are going on to, to new things. How many of you already know what you're going on to? Great. How many of you don't know what you're going on to yet? Okay, some of you. Well, for those of you in that last category in particular, but all of you at some point will be ready for another transition and not yet sure what, what uh, to move on to, I think the comment about the, the social networking and the, um, and the personal networking, again, I just wanna, wanna emphasize, I will say that I have, um, how many of you are signed on to the Fellows Careers Listserv? Okay, so not every hand in this room is raised. I hope you all know that there's a Fellows Careers Lister. We've been promoting it since orientation. You should be on it because senior folks who are in the um, s and Policy Fellows Network send out 
send us job opportunities all the time. Your fellow fellows, current fellows and alumni fellows are sending jobs all the time. Um, so it's really, it's critical to be on there because you, you see a great range of things. And even if it's not something that you might be interested, you might have colleagues who are interested and you are welcome to pass those um, position descriptions and announcements on to others in your network because that also makes our network, you, valuable to other folks outside. Um, so I send out a lot of things. A lot of folks send out a lot on that, that uh, list. Um, I encourage you to get on it. But I, again, I also encourage you for here's another reason to make sure that your profiles are updated, LinkedIn, that you're mentioning at some place, and maybe it's under awards that you had a, a fellowship. Because we do recommend people. I am getting more and more phone calls from executive search firms. Some of you are not ready for the, the positions um, that I'm being called about, but someday you will be. And some of you are already at those levels. Um, most search firms, happily, they're usually they're um, comfortable letting me share that information and the jobs on the, the Fellows Career Listserv because I don't know all 3,000 alumni and I wouldn't want to miss recommending someone. But there are firms that don't want to, to have that information just passed on broadly. They really are very, very targeted. And I can't tell them um, the best information about you if your profiles aren't up to date, because I use the, the fellows' careers and LinkedIn, the, our different LinkedIn groups, to go find out what you're doing, make sure I have the right backgrounds and can make some recommendations. And I know my staff colleagues do too. And of course, your colleagues, the fellow fellows, are getting calls from executive search firms. And the fellows profiles um, on LinkedIn and Fellows Central are places they might go to as well. So I just want to remind you about that and encourage you to, to keep those up to date, not just now, but going into the future. So we have a break now for about another 10 minutes, quarter of. We're going to start the next topic. Is there anything other announcements? Okay, so enjoy the break, and we'll start again at 1045.